pueblo jamás se hará vencido. En el pueblo unido jamás se hará vencido. En el pueblo unido jamás se hará vencido. En el pueblo unido jamás se hará vencido. Welcome to the Mimecast. This is Michael Jean Sullivan. For the past 60 years, the Tony and Obie Award-winning, and despite its name never ever silent, San Francisco Mime Troupe has brought its brand of revolutionary theater to audiences across the country and around the world. Their original musical comedies, and some dramas, but mainly comedies, have tackled social, economic, and environmental justice, civil rights, workers' rights, gender equality, oppression at home and abroad, and how capitalism is essentially antithetical to democracy. Hundreds of artists, actors, designers, writers, directors, composers, lyricists, and choreographers have helped the mime troupe inform, entertain, and stir up the working class over the decades. And the Mimecast is a chance to get to know some of them a little bit better. And today we have veteran mime troupe actor, director, singer, songwriter, and collective member, Valina Brown. How are you doing, Valina? I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> good. Well, it's good to hear from you in that you're just over there, technically, mm-hmm. in the <laughs> next room. Because um, for those of you who don't know, we're married. Ta-da. And we've been together for quite some time. Um, though it seems like only moments. Uh, okay, so what I want to do is, what I'm asking everyone is to really tell me about how did they become the artist that they are. And so uh, the way we start that is the obvious. Where were you born? I was born in Staten Island, New York. Ah, New Yorker. So why? why <laughs> Not you, really, but that's where you, I was born. <laughs> why are you born in New York? Well, because my dad was stationed there. Um, my dad was a career army officer. And so when he and my mom, who met at Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama, they, they were engaged for four years. I'm going to start at the beginning because I know that you Mm -hmm. like for people to do that. Um, they were engaged for four years at Tuskegee and then they, they graduated in May and, um, got married in September and he was uh, in ROCT and he went into the military and then his first tour of duty was in New York. And so, mm. so while they were there, I, um, I was conceived and then, uh, and then 18 months later I left for Germany and didn't look back because <laughs> in there, that's where my sister was born in, in Germany. So how did your parents, uh, uh, you know, them? they both went to Tuskegee. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that usual for their families? Did they come a lot of, a lot of college going folks? Yeah. Or- um, well, um, all of, all of my mom's siblings uh, graduated from Tuskegee, except for the, wow. older, the oldest who mm-hmm. went I can't remember where he went and then he he bailed like he he's seven years older than the next oldest uh um sibling, sibling? Uh-huh. and so he was like an only kid for you know for seven years and um so he kind of was used to doing his own thing or something because everybody else mm-hmm. was born after that really close together and they all all um six of them went to Tuskegee and finished and but he went to a different school and then bailed within like the first year or something so wow he was, what did, huh. he was the only one of the seven kids that didn't finish so yeah so it was like lots of um and that's your mother's side that was your mother's side and yeah. what about your father's side um my father's side his now on the fa- my father's side the difference was that only the boys got to go to college Mm. And um, so he and one brother went to um, went to Tuskegee. I think the other other brother went to like Grambling or something. And oh, then wow. there were then there were two older brothers because my dad was um, next to the baby, whereas my mm. mom was was like in the top, the older three, and he was my dad was like um, next to the baby and. 
the there were two older boys who significantly older who went to the military for a few years and then came out and they and they didn't go to college they were both barbers and and oh wow and followed both barbers it. yeah and they had they had their shop their chairs next to each other um and that's what they that's what they did so um so two or huh. three maybe maybe three of them went to tuskegee so it wasn't as wow. like boom the way that my mom's side was um but still and, that was the college that they all is was that the closest college is that the local or what was that the the well, pinnacle college that that was pretty great to get into tuskegee it was yeah that's what i mean yeah, yeah. so um i actually don't know what the story is behind um my dad's side going there mm -hmm. but like my mom's side it was like my grandfather went, he went to Tuskegee uh, on a trip. And it might have been because it seemed like it was like one of the aunts or uncles were sick and they took them to Tuskegee because there's a hospital there. And then while they were there, um, they visited the campus. And my dad, my grandfather was really inspired by, there's a big statue there where mm. there's a picture of, of um, you know, like, uh, maybe it's just one person, like a guy, I mean, you know, a black guy um, with a, uh, like a blanket over him oh, or whatever. Yeah. Was, yeah. You know, lifting and, and the veil being, of slavery. Lifting, no, the veil of ignorance, lifting yeah. the veil of ignorance. And that, that statue really inspired my grandfather. And he said, okay, yeah, I think that's really important. Um, that lifting that the veil of ignorance and that's what's going to be uh create the options for my kids and um because um you know he was a farmer and uh and um he wanted his kids to to have more options of what they could do and so and i thought that was really an interesting story also just in the way that art can really inspire someone to the mm. point where it really affects the entire family the statue yeah because it can bring it all to it, it's it makes it concrete in a way that you can have all of the theoretical and all the language and all of that stuff but then when it comes down to it the statue or the painting that mm -hmm. makes it like uh takes all of that idea and just just essentializes it in a way which that's the point of art so what did your parents study when they went so my mom was a a, a nurse so she studied nursing there, and my dad's um, major was PE, actually. Really? He, he was oh. a football player. He um, and he what he was really hoping to do was go into. He either wanted to to be a coach, or mm -hmm. he wanted to go into. He wanted to go into physical therapy because a lot mm -hmm. of with phys ed majors you had to there was like a parallel in terms of a lot of the things that you had to learn if you were in pre-med you had to learn as a pe major so really? he huh. yeah um uh all the anatomy physiology stuff mm -hmm. and uh so he he was interested in in being a physical therapist mm -hmm. um but when he got out of school and applied to the there was a training program for physical therapists mm -hmm. and he wasn't allowed to go into it because he was black and he was hmm. a black because he was a black male it mm -hmm. was like it was a field where there were lots of women and it was like a lot of white women in that training program and they didn't want a black man in that program hmm That's, all the lots yeah. of hands-on stuff on the body you're touching a lot of people yeah yeah Ooh. yeah so so yeah so that was that was weird so um so what do you think made him want to get into into that i mean you know people a lot of times they go into nursing like your mother because they want to take care of people uh -huh. um, and and help folks was it similar with your father I think he was interested in just like that in, in somehow like physical therapy and like, and like, like sports, you know, dealing with sports injury. And I mean, I, I think because he was a, a 
a jock, I think that that's where maybe that interest came from. Mm. What what was his jockness? He he played football. Mm. He mm. got to he got to be um, a varsity on the varsity team as a freshman. Wow. Because, because he was yeah, because he was very good. He was really um, he was big. Uh, you know, like he had the the body and the strength and you know. He was mm. talented. So, so um, your parents, your parents meet and fall in love. Mm-hmm. And in college, uh, and so how did they? Um, were they from uh, sim- similar places? How far apart were their families? Like some people, you know, they're they they meet somewhere and their families are like from opposite ends of the country. Yeah, I mean, they were that. both from the south. My dad was from Columbus, Georgia, and. Um, the uh fort benning Mm -hmm. army base right there is a big influencer and and um employer of Mm -hmm. people in columbus georgia school of the americas just right across the is it the the chattahoochee river or something it's just right Mm -hmm. there um and then mom was um so that was a mid time mid-sized town columbus Mm -hmm. georgia whereas my mom was from a tiny tiny town called Beatrice, Alabama. That's how you mm. say it there is Beatrice, mm-hmm. but you might read it and say Beatrice. But, oh, because I'm a northerner? I see what but, you're saying. No, no. I mean, l- literally nobody there that's from there says Beatrice, but it's spelled mm-hmm. like that. But everybody mm-hmm. says Beatrice. So it's a tiny town. and um, But, you know, Dad was from Georgia and mom was from Alabama right. and they met. So they didn't have a big no. culture clash when they met up in school. No, um, no, not really. I mean, that it's it was a mixed marriage in that my dad was a Baptist and my mom was a Methodist. <laughs> yeah, I guess for some people that would be a mixed marriage. Yeah. It's like, ooh, you're so different. Um, OK, so they so they meet up. They're at school. They 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 graduate. They, um, and they and his first. And so he goes through RTC and he, so he comes out an officer. He That's right. Lieutenant. Yeah. yeah. What made him decide to do the military as opposed to like, so he's in college and he's playing football and he's wanting to be a, you know, if he's going to be a physical therapist or a coach or whatever, but he ends up in the army. How did that happen? Or why did that happen? Well, I don't know the whole thing about that, but I, I, I just remember him feeling like, you know, I remember him saying that, you know, that mom got to do exactly what she went to school to do, like exactly. She wanted to be a nurse. She had a cousin who was much older than her that um, she when she would come home, I guess, for the holidays or something. I'm not sure this older cousin. And she saw her in the white dress, the way the that people, you know, when you have an image I guess if you're of our generation, you have a certain image of a nurse that's in the white dress and Mm, the white stockings and the white shoes and the hat. Yeah. And, um, and the cape. Oh yeah. There's a a cape. Um, I still have those. That, you know, she just looked, just looked up to her and, you know, and was like, Oh, I want to be a nurse. That looks great. I mean, just basically based on, the uniform, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and fortunately she actually really got into, uh, nursing. Like she actually really enjoyed nursing because you can, sometimes you can look at something and it seems a certain way. And then when you get into it, you're like, Oh no, you know, this sucks. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so he, he always talked about how, you know, mom knew that she wanted to be a nurse, went to school to be a nurse and, and always very easily got a job. Um, you know, and, and that was a thing about getting jobs, uh, plural, mm-hmm. because, because we were moving. And oh, so, right. yeah. so she would have to quit her job and, and go Ooh. and, you know, like every time and, mm-hmm. um, apply for another job. And she never had a problem getting a job. Mm. Uh, uh, whereas dad had tried for a while to get into, um, physical therapy and then he won and then he tried to get into, um, maybe um, teaching PE and coaching mm. and that sort of thing, and somehow that didn't work out. I don't, I don't know the all of the details of that. Um, mm. 
but he was in ROTC, so he was able to. Right. And so when he graduated, when they graduated, he graduated in a, a uniform. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So because when he came out, he was yeah. he was an army officer. So um, so yeah, I don't I don't really get quite the timeline around a lot of that stuff, but I well, just I guess know. sometimes it's like, you know, people do ROTC because it yeah. helps them pay for school. Yes. You know. And so then when they get out, whatever they wanted to do, they also have a, another commitment that they have to fulfill, which is in the military. Right. And they and they might want to go do the military for a while and then eventually get to their other job. But sometimes they stay in the military. Yeah. Which he did yeah. for 22 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Um, so they end up in New York. Mm -hmm. And how long were they in New York? Just just long enough to pop you out or did they were they there for a little while? Well, like I said, I was um, 18 months when we moved to mm -hmm. Germany, and mm. um, I was born a couple years after they got married. Mm -hmm. So I guess they were, you know, because I because th I think she was able to get a job right away in Tuskegee, mm -hmm. and then um, oh, so wow. so that was the thing is that yeah. it was like she was it always able to just boom get a job, and so like that was the mm -hmm. thing is like. I was the first one to get a job. In fact, act in her, like in her cohort, her. Oh, really? So mm. that's the thing. Uh, that's the other part of the story is that this, the, that, you know, but I want to tell yeah. uh, that my grandmother's plan for how all, th all these kids were going to go to college was that, um, each the older three kids were assigned a, each of them a younger kid and mm -hmm. so when you got through then you're supposed to help the next one through and so on and that's mm -hmm. how they were all gonna get through and how they all did get through but um again she was able to get a job um the easiest of everybody because like mom's older sister wasn't able to get a job that she, the kind of job that she wanted mm -hmm. and and so but then when mom came out she did so she was helping basically with her be, beginning entry level nursing uh job she was actually helping support kind of everybody else oh wow you know um because because t velma was not able to help the person that was assigned to her because she wasn't able to get, she wanted to be a home ec teacher mm -hmm. and she wasn't able to get a position. Like, again, I think, I think it was that, that sort of thing of either the schools that had those positions, um, they were not hiring black women to, to do mm -hmm. them. So, um, so once she, um, so it took a while to get situated mm. there. And so mom was helping her and she was helping the person that she was assigned and then um, other people too. And um, huh. so. So, I mean, it sounds like the from from both families, there is a really a sense of of kind of the family as a community helping each other to 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 move ahead it wasn't like oh, yeah. you know you have some kids they grow up and they move away it was very much a set of uh, plans on right. how to uh, how how know. everybody's getting yeah. out yeah mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. yeah that's very much kind of of the time in a way you know it's like that early civil rights movement era and ap really after after the war after World War II, where families were really like, okay, so this is an opportunity. P you know, some people that had had been in the military and had had a uh, different uh, income, had you know GI bills and all of this, and the economy of the country was changing enough so that a lot of families of all different backgrounds were kind of like, we can move ahead now. We can do something. There's a prosperity. Since the United States was the only country in the world that didn't have its factories bombed in World War II, right. there's more prosperity, and so people could do more. And it sounds like they really took advantage of that and had that mindset yeah. early well, on. Well, absolutely. You know, the um, the the African saying about if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you have to bring everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I think that I don't. 
I mean, I didn't hear that saying from my grandparents, but how they behaved really illustrates that Mm -hmm. um, in terms of how they taught their kids and how, you know, so uh, how we were all raised. Then my grandmother's saying was always that you have to stick together. And the way she would say it is she would say, you've got to stick together. You know, she would hit that. That's a sticky. Stick together. And so that's what she said to her kids and that's what she said to us for as long as she was alive and 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 then her kids um you know continued that with with our generation so mm-hmm. um so yeah that that there was very much that um that we stick together cool you know that it's not about like well i'm so la di da cuz i yeah. went and you didn't or whatever like that's right, that's not a competition that is not cool that attitude so they're married they oh did they just out of curiosity so where did they get married did they get married in beatrice did they get married in, in beatrice yeah okay yeah huh. my my um my mom's older sister made her wedding dress wow yeah and um, she, I think, I think she might have been in Germany because her husband was in the military, but not mm-hmm. for a whole career, but he was in the military. That's where my cousin Marjorie was born. She was born in Germany like Kara was. Mm. And so, um, yeah, so she um, got mom's measurements or whatever and, you know, and just being her sister. <laughs> I don't know. Like somehow she made this dress for her and it fit her perfectly. It was so cute. Hmm. Yeah. So now when they went to Germany as, you know, uh, there's a certain, there's a certain personality of people who are like adventurous, you know, they want to go off, they want to do stuff. And one of the things with the army is that whether you want to do it or not, they're going to order you to go off and do something. You know, you may not ever have want to left your town, leave your town, but you're suddenly you're in, you know, you're stationed uh, on the outskirts of Turkey or something or mm-hmm. wherever American troops happen to be at that time. Now, for your parents, ha- were they particularly adventurous and, and, you know, wanting to go off to Germany or were they like, well, this is what we got to do? Yeah, I, I don't I don't really think of my parents as super adventurous. It's like I don't know that that's really the right word for them, but they I because I think what they were what they were is um you know upwardly mobile mhm you know and so and they very much about like what these are the things that you need to do to you know do well in whatever path you've taken so like dad's an army officer mm-hmm. and so you get orders to move different places and that's just just that's the gig and mm. so um so there wasn't any kind of thing about that that I I didn't pick up anything about being super adventurous, but I di- also didn't pick up anything about recoiling from it. Mm-hmm. It was like, no, this is this is this is the gig, right? You know, well, it was so there was people... a ma- there was just a very matter of fact um, vibe to it, which I appreciate. You know, because yeah, I, well, that's a I big remember deal. seeing you know, like hearing about, and and I feel like I saw a kid's mom like crying because they were get, they'd gotten orders to move or whatever. And I remember as a little kid, just being absolutely appalled that this grown person is crying about, you know what I mean? Because as a kid, it's like, you just, you, all right, this is what we're doing. You know, like we're, we're an army family, an army brat, like th- this is what we do. And to see a grown up mom, like, <gasps> we have to move. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that was just not cool. And mm. so that never, that never happened in our family. We just, yeah. we did, we took orders. What was needed to do. So are your earliest memories are in, of Germany? Yes. What do you remember? Um, I remember that the sky was always kind of gray and overcast. It was like always like the sunset district or something and what it looked like. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember my sister being born because um, I was three when she was born. I had the measles. I didn't feel well. 
Um, mm. And I, uh, I remember the beer and bread trucks that came around. I can't remember how frequently. Beer they... and bread trucks? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, so they had the big, big things of the, you know, that hearty German bread yeah. and the bottles um, of huh. uh, kind of fancy bottles yeah. of beer. Um, beer steins everywhere. We huh. came back with sets of beer, you know, like yeah. the graduated. So like, this is dad's, this is mom's, this is mine, uh-huh. this is here. It's like, we like Goldilocks of, yes. with beer. Only beer, yeah. Yeah, um, beer deluxe. And uh, I remember beer. that there was um, a German, an old, he, I, who knows, he could have been 35, but he seemed old to me. Uh, he was he was older than that. Um, German guy who would help me with my bike because often like, the chain would jump off of my, my bike or mm-hmm. my like training wheels would kind of flip up or something, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, he would help me fix my, my bike. Mm-hmm. So, uh, he was, he was around. So maybe, I don't know, maybe he was retired or something. I, like, I don't know why he, it, he was around, but, um, but that was helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? So how long were you in Germany? We were there for like two and a half years i guess because i i we left we left there i think we left there when i was like five because i started so i went to um nursery school in germany and then i went to kindergarten in in texas texas Mm -hmm. that's a big cultural shift yeah san antonio texas Hmm. how long were you guys in texas we were there again about two and a half years and each one of these times your mother is having to get a new job every time yeah. you move or you guys moved yeah yeah and also <laughs> i mean like we moved to we moved at least twice while we were in germany oh really and then we moved twice while we were in texas and we moved mm-hmm. like three two or three times while we were in alabama wow that's a tough life yeah. So, I mean, that. so that's, you know, I used to think of it in terms of like, okay, I was born in New York and then my sister was born in Texas and then we, pardon me, Germany. Germany and then we moved to Texas, uh, kindergarten there, first grade in, in Alabama. Like I thought of it that way. And then I realized, no, but we kept, we moved while we were there. And then that's mm-hmm. when I realized that I had at one point, I'd moved nine times by the time I was nine. Wow. That's a lot of moving. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, one of the things that I found is, like, uh, I think I've mentioned this to you before, that how many of the people I've talked to, how many performers have that as part of their past? They yeah. moved for economic reasons. They moved because of some, one of their parents or both their parents were in the military. They moved because their family had immigrated somewhere or from mm-hmm. someplace to someplace and then maybe someplace else or just through the United States. It, there's always this sense of people who, and from my perspective, uh, and I mean, because my family, we moved a lot when I was a kid too. There's a, a reinvention of yourself, always having to kind of scope out, figure out how things are here. And then you also get to kind of choose who you're going to be here, no matter how truthful that is to you. But it but it can be a little more conscious uh, choice than mm-hmm. it is when you're you're just in the same town the whole your whole life you're right. changing everybody else's around you is changing you have no opportunity to reinvent yourself mm-hmm. whereas when you're always moving there is that chance of i'm going to be like this you know i'm going to be a jock here i'm going to be you know um and it's because yeah. there's nobody to tell you there's nobody to tell you you have there's no pressure on you to be the same right no one's saying oh that's that's not what you're really like. That's not, yeah. you know, uh, I find that, yeah, the idea of someone reinforce, enforcing uh, your, the this is uh, our agreed upon identity, right? Yeah. This is who, and I, because I remember seeing a girl at, at a bus stop downtown. She, she looked like very, you know, like maybe uh, older teens or, in her early 20s or something and she was going out for a, a job and mm-hmm. um and so she had gone to buy some some clothes for this and and she 
met up with two other friends and and they said hey like what did you get and she showed them what she, he'd only gotten a couple of things and and they were like that's it you know and she and they're like they looked at the tag on something and they were like it costs this much but she was getting like she was getting things that were a little bit like higher quality or something and and they were just appalled that she, that she had mm. paid that much for a blouse or or something in there and and the the line we're not like that hmm. we don't do this you know was mm. like whew, that that really that kind of hit me i felt so bad for her that her friends yeah. were telling her like pulling her coattail saying no you can't you know you can't spin that yeah. on a t on a blouse. Like that's not who that's we are. That's not and you. It's, and it's like, yeah. yeah, but I'm trying to I'm trying to get a trying to get a better job, and I have to look the part, you know. And so yeah, yeah when you're moving around all the time, there isn't somebody to, to snatch you back and say, this is who you are, even if right. even if you have changed or something, you know. Um, and then I definitely I definitely felt like when I was leaving Maryland mm -hmm. um, that because we stayed there the longest before mm. we got out here and then we stayed out out here dad's final tour of duty was on the Presidio in San mm -hmm. Francisco but we were in Maryland for five years and that was that was a five years is a long time yeah and, especially when you're a kid yeah when you're 10 it's I like mean, half your life yeah and so um, I, I, a lot of great things. I got to do a lot of great things that set who I am today in terms of I got, I learned to play the guitar there and to play the French horn there. And I started doing theater there and like all these, you know, all these things that are, are part of, I mean, I don't still play French horn, but um but I did when I came out here, which is how I met you in band. Mm -hmm. um, so that was great. But I had I had a rough time there. I was definitely mm. bullied there. And uh, because I was, you know, um, you know, I didn't sound like the people from there. And there are people who were having a really hard time with that. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't like it. Um, so that was, that was rough. It was really rough, uh, in, in a lot of ways for mm -hmm. me. I developed some ticks and th nervous ticks and things like that. And, hmm. um, that took, it took a while for me to get rid of once I got out here. Um, and these I, were from uh, everybody, uh, the black kids, the white kids. No. Well, okay. So this was the thing, um, in terms of black kids, white kids. When my dad went to Vietnam, we were not allowed to stay on the post in Fort McClellan. They've changed that rule, but at the time, this ridiculous rule was that if the sponsor, who is the person in the military, moves off of the post, the family, the dependents, cannot stay, even if he's going away to defend his country. <laughs> and so that's so weird it was really uh abusive so we moved off the post but nearby because mom worked there she mm. you know and so we were in, we moved off to anderson alabama and um the the mill the uh elementary school i'm trying to think of the name of it right now Cause I, I, yeah, I'm going to call them out if I remember their name. Um, uh, I integrated that school. I was the first black person to ever go to that, that school in Anderson. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that case, I was being shunned and whatnot by white kids. And then, uh, then when dad came back, um, we moved back onto the post. And so I, so it was like first grade on the post, second grade, integrating a school, third grade back on the post. Um, and then fourth grade, I'm in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And so I, and so I, I was like, well, the Washington DC area 
is very, you know, has a, a high African American uh, population. So mm-hmm. that isolated feeling that you had in the second grade, um, and it was like mixed first and third, like military mm-hmm. kids, everybody's, yeah. everybody's there. So um, there'll be lots of black kids and you won't feel it. And it was like, it was precisely the black kids who were bullying me. So it, you know, so I kept thinking, okay, um, oh, it's, it's, it's um, the white people that are gonna give me a hard time you know, but, uh, and then when I'm with black people, that's going to be better. And it was like, that was not better. That was like there, I got along with the white people better than I got along with most of the black people. Mm. And so that was confusing. Um, But it was like, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I just, you know, I just didn't have the the accent, I didn't have, I, I didn't have the same, um, I've had more of a middle military kid culture than a Washington DC area culture. Um, mm-hmm. Used to, you know, adapting as best I can. But one of the things that I never really did was code switch. Mm-hmm. And I, You know, like a lot of people talk about how important it is to code switch and stuff like that. And I just never did. And Mm -hmm. so um, maybe my life would have been easier in a sense if I had. But um, I didn't know. But here's the thing. I didn't know the code to switch to. Like when I first got there. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I I didn't. It would have it would have taken a little while. Right. To get. So, I mean, like. Yeah. you know, as an actor now, I can yeah. do all, you know, uh, switch up whatever's needed, you know. Right. Uh, but at the time, I was just like being myself, and that was just, that was problematic. There was a mistake right there. Yeah. And so, but I realized that there was a certain point where it was like, you know, so pe- so people were wanting me to, uh, you know, to be different. And then it was like, no, I'm not going to be different. This is me. This is who I am. And mm-hmm. I'm, and I don't expect you, I don't roll up into a new town and expect everybody to adjust to me. And I don't, but I also don't think that people should expect me to pretend like I'm somebody different than who I am either, you know? Yeah. Um, because that was, that was the thing I just remember in third grade in the class, like it was such a mixture of, it's like those, it's like those, those war films, you know, where you got the kid from, from Kentucky and you got the kid from Brooklyn. There was that kid in Brooklyn from Brooklyn. His, his family was from Brooklyn. And so like when he talked, like his cheeks would puff out like that, you know, because, because of that accent, you know what I mean? Like their people were just from all, one of my good friends uh, was from Argentina and didn't, didn't really speak English yet we got to be really good friends, you know, but, um, so, but her dad was in Argentine military and was in, worked at, at an embassy or something like that, you know? So military kids are used to people being from all over the place and you, you don't freak out about that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you'd be freaking out all the time, but these kids were from one place and they weren't used to. And so it was just kind of like, ah, she's out. You know, like people literally screaming, literally, I'm not exaggerating, like that. Mm-hmm. And um, and it's like, why are you screaming, you know? Um, so anyway, mm. I, I digress. Not um, really. No, you don't. Okay. Uh, but you did say, so you were saying in, in Maryland, you started to, uh, you, you mentioned the French horn, guitar, and theater. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what started your interest as a performer? Because not everybody, you know, people, there are people who, really enjoy theater or music or whatever they enjoy listening to it Mm -hmm. um they enjoy going to plays or whatever well when do you feel like that like the doing it as a thing not like it thinking you're going to be doing it professionally but to actually start to do stuff what was the where do you feel like that started well okay so rolling back to alabama i saw my dad in uh the fort mcclellan little theater they decided to do Guys and Dolls. He uh, 
he was nicely, nicely Johnson. And um, it was just really exciting, you know, seeing the seeing that play that the the military band uh-huh. on the post played the you know was the orchestra and um and it was like lieutenant sally gundy played adelaide and mm-hmm. she was great <laughs> she was so great um and now, I, had your father done any other acting before that not that I'm aware of. No, I mean, he might have been, you know, done like Christmas pageants or something in the church when he was little or something like that. But oh, he liked to uh, sing. Yeah, but they, yeah, he was, he was, uh, I think, recruited because he could really sing. And, um, and he was always practicing that, you know, I dreamed last night I yeah. got on the boat to heaven. And so, um, yeah. They got me at the overture. <laughs> so good. And so, yeah, so I've told the story many times now that when, you know, I just leaned over to my mom and whispered to her that, you know, I want to do this. You know, I just, and so I was sure She was thrilled. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, she, she wasn't, um, I don't remember her being any way in particular about it. I mean, you know, your six year old looking at that and going, oh, that looks fun. It's like, yeah, it does look fun. Um, those were grown ups up there doing it. Um and so I didn't get to actually do a play until several years later. Um mm-hmm. when I I did my first play when I was 13. And uh and that was really fun. And I got my laughs. And so that was like, yes, I like this. I want to do this. And, and what was that first play? What did you do? It was an original play. Um, one of the things that was really cool about um, the Montgomery, Montgomery County school system is that it was very well funded at that time. So all of that all of the arts and that sort of thing were were fully funded. And mm-hmm. and there was like at least a week, it, it was either a week or a month, I can't remember how long, of just, like, it's art, about art, you know, and so, um, so one of the things that we did was um, make our, make a play. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so, like, there were kids who were already doing it, and then, um, and then I got recruited in, like, one person, something, somebody didn't work out, and um, so then they asked me, to to come into it and do it and um it was were you hanging out with them or they heard you singing or acting or just I, friends i don't remember how that happened exactly um because but it was it was in a it was an original the first my first two plays were original plays mm-hmm. um and uh so yeah so it was really it was like it was like ms I don't, it was Miss Some Miss Somethings. I have I want to say Havisham, but that's like mm-hmm. from a Dickens book, and I don't know if we if we ripped off that name or not. But it was something like Miss Havisham's School for Girls. Ooh, Miss Havisham would have a weird. She's uh, <laughs> that's Great Expectations. She'd have a the cake with the rats in it. And yeah, it, I know. School and for then, girls, and then girls trying to yeah, right, yeah. There. Um, no, so like it was this this um situation where the school for girls and uh someone is like snuck a boy into the the you know because it's a boarding school like that kind of thing and so you know hilarity ensues and so um so that was the first one and so that was really fun and then um yeah I just kept I just kept doing it as as much as I could when I had opportunity um and then, like, uh, I had a teacher in, like, the fourth grade or something who uh, agreed to uh, teach us guitar, like, if we wanted to uh-huh. stay in and work on learning chords instead of, um, you know, going outside and playing. And mm-hmm. so, um, recess. And so that was, so that was the start of that. And, um and that was fun, you know, to do. And I got one of my performance badges playing uh, close to oh, you. You were a Girl Scout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. And so Karen Carpenter's "Close to You." That 
process mm-hmm. when I was I was terrified. Um, but you know, I did it. I did it. And that once you do it, and that's the thing I try to tell my students now, now that I'm I'm teaching also high school drama, that um when they're waiting until they're not nervous, it's like that's not how it works. That never gonna happen. You have to do it and then realize that you survived. And then mm-hmm. you have more confidence the next time, but you, you can't wait until you don't feel nervous because, of course, you feel nervous. Um, right. If you're not nervous, you're psychotic. Um. So, but I mean, I was terrified that first time. Yeah. So, like, I had the the stand, the music stand right in front of me. I'm like playing the guitar and, I, and, and I'm just looking at the music and my hands are shaking. And there was one co- chord that was really hard for me to play that always twanged, you know? And so. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I was, I was struggling. I wasn't, I wasn't, um, you know, very good, uh, at doing that yet, but it was important to do. Let's kicked off that, that, uh, that's before I did a play. Right. And so why French horn? French horn happened because I was able to, uh, make my lips buzz the day that he passed around the French horn mouthpiece. I uh-huh. thought I was going to play something that I had heard of, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and I thought, well, maybe I'll do trombone or maybe I'll do trumpet or something like that. Or like if I had played flute, that's so much easier to carry than a yeah. French horn. Um, and so but I couldn't get a sound out of any of the other um you know, out of the, any of the other instruments. And so I went home and I was pr- practicing, practicing my amateur, you know, and how mm-hmm. to make my lips make that tight and how to make my lips buzz. And so it's like, great, I've got it. And then he brought in the French horn thing and I made, I had a buzz out of that. He goes, great, you're a French horn. I'm like, oh, wait, I, I thought, where's the, tr-? no. And so that's how that ended up. And then, mm. uh, but then I, I ended up really, loving the French horn. It has such a gorgeous sound. And mm-hmm. so, and then I just started like listening for it all the time. And, and then um, like Barry White, you know, his, his Love Unlimited Orchestra, he yeah. used the French uh, horn French a lot. Horn. Sexy, sexy, yeah. sexy instrument. People don't know. <laughs> I don't know if, if French horn is really such a sexy instrument, but it's, it is. It, well, okay. Some but of it's us. A for some of us, it's it is. beautiful. It's beautiful. For some of us, it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. But um, don't want to force anybody. But that's yeah. So that's how that mm-hmm. happened, and and so um, I uh, yeah, I played that from I guess it was eighth grade when we when I started mm-hmm. seventh seventh or eighth grade, and then you know, and then we moved. Again. Right. And so then you end up in California at the Presidio. Right. And at Roosevelt, then junior high. It's a, it's a middle school now, but then junior high came in as a ninth grader. And I was really like, oh, man, I hope that they have a band. Like, I didn't know anything about what school I was going to be going to. Um, I hope they have a band. I hope I hope they let me in the band. Like, I don't know what it takes to be in the band there or whatever. And. Um, and it just turned out that I, um, Mr. Jim Bruno, Bruno. Um, he was very friendly and he was like, oh, you play the French horn. Okay, great. And so he gave me a piece of music to, to play. And I mean, mm-hmm. I, I had to, I was sight reading the music and sight reading I'll just be honest, it's not something that I would advertise like, yeah, I'm great at sight reading. Like, no. Um, But he put it in front of me and somehow or another, I played it correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, like the first time. And um, it it wasn't until after I finished playing it that it was like, oh, that's what that was. Like, I didn't know what the tune was, you know. And so um, somehow I did it right. And he was like, okay, your first chair. And I was like, <laughs> what? And, and, and I also felt like, what? Because what about the guy that's been here the whole time? Like he's been in, in the band the whole time. 
And so this new person just comes in and plays something and immediately is first chair. So I felt a little like, mm, like this guy's going to hate my guts. And we're, mm-hmm. there's just two of us right. in, in this section. And, um, but, uh, did he? I don't know. We weren't friends, but, um, he, he, he you know, he wasn't. You can never tell because sometimes being first chair is such pressure that sometimes it might be nice to go, phew, I'm not first chair anymore. Well, yeah. I guess he was only chair unless maybe yeah. the, the previous <laughs> person, maybe they maybe they had graduated from mm, and he was I left. Yeah, because if there's only one chair, then you're both first and second chair. You're chair. And so yeah. I'm sure you probably, probably was fine. Yeah, I remember. I think I remember when you came in. I definitely remember you showing up to class and Jim Bruno going, this is Valina Brown. This is a new person. She just moved here. And you kind of waved at everybody. And I was over there in the uh, percussion section. And we were all just went, ooh. You did? You went, ooh? Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in here. Uh, okay. You know, as, te- as teenage boys, it was like me and Dwayne, Dwayne. and, and uh, Stephen Witt. We weren't going to like, woo out uh-huh. loud. But we wooed inside. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so when you came out here, so you're doing that. You're still guitaring. Were you were you still interested in theater at that point when, at Roosevelt? Yeah, but there wasn't really an opportunity to do it. There, there, mm-hmm. it, there. The funding for the schools out here was not as good as it was in Maryland. Mm-hmm. Like people were always. I I just remember hearing teachers talking about like, oh, if we do this field trip um it's gonna cost so much money and and we don't have the funding or you know what i mean like and it there was there there was banned which i was really mm-hmm. glad about and there i mean there was still stuff compared to the way the schools are now um mm-hmm. but it um yeah there wasn't there wasn't like a theater department or anything i think there was a theater club and I remember the only yeah. way that I found out that there was a theater club was one day there was an assembly and the theater club did a scene. And, and I yeah. and I I wasn't impressed. <laughs> and I was It was like, no oh. Miss Haversham school for girls. It was not. Yeah. And um so I was kind of like, hmm, but how how come but it was like this click, the recognizable click that was the drama club, it He's seemed fine. like. And I was like, hmm, well, I'm not interested in that, what they're doing up there anyway. Um, but then when we got to Washington, Washington you know, High School, Washington High School, there there was there was the spring musical and the fall drama and there was choir, several choirs and there was band. So I was do it, doing band and um, and uh, auditioning for and doing the plays. Um, and then once our band teacher that was there when we first got there, Takamoto, once he left and moved to Japan, then the new person that came in was so, um, awful. Yeah. That uh, he just made it my, what had been my favorite class, he made it absolutely miserable. And so I was like, okay. I'm not going to be a professional French horn player. Um, you know, I people who actually play the French horn like professionally generally don't have like an overbite and full lips. It's like it's better if your teeth are really straight and no lips. Though, so, oh, I wonder if they if they had a, a black woman uh French horn player for the SF Symphony. I don't know if she's still there or not, but I remember mm-hmm. it was really exciting to see that because it just it was like, oh, okay, she's she's navigating that, you know, with lips. Yeah. Um, so when did you start singing? I mean, like, because you were talking about band, you're talking about theater, right. and you're talking about that, but but uh, at some point you started singing enough so that you were going to eventually get a, a, a voice scholarship. Well, I. I always sang, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, that was just like, you sing around the house. Like my dad always sang around and, mm-hmm. you know, but so I mean, as I a always, performer, I was always singing in it, but then, okay. So the first time I, when I did close to you, mm-hmm. um, I guess that, that was my first like public performance. And I guess I was 11, 
maybe 10, maybe 10, Mm -hmm. um, was my first time. I think I might've been 10 because I didn't, because I think I was still playing the like really twangy first guitar that my parents got me that was almost a toy. Like it wasn't really a good guitar. And then, but they didn't want to invest, uh, in case I just got bored of it and didn't, you know, didn't keep it up. So Mm -hmm. when I was 11, they bought me a real grown up nice Mm. guitar. And, uh, and I don't think that was the guitar that I was playing. So I think I, I was probably 10. And then, um, you know, once we got to, uh, Washington, Louise McTurnan, um, now that I'm a, I, uh, a high school drama teacher, just finishing up my fourth year as a high school drama teacher. Uh, I really appreciate her. So, you, you know, like more and more, the more I, you know, I think about all the stuff that she was doing, because it was a cappella choir, chamber choir, women's choir, men's choir. She had us prepare it and we, you know, so that we could go and do solo and ensemble festivals. She prepared us for the California All-State Honor Choir auditions. And that is how I met uh, Byron McGilvray, who was a professor at San Francisco State, who was impressed with my voice and said, I want you to come to my department. And, um, and arrange for a a little scholarship for me. Um, Mm. And so, you know, so really, really uh, performing a lot, singing, even though I sing, that's like, that's home base. I sing, as you know, I sing all the time. Uh, Just that's part of my expression as Mm. a person. Um, So the way that that, I got to really be doing that all the time was really in, in high, high school. In high school. Yeah. Cause you were doing that and you were singing. So when you get out of high school, a couple of things happen. It, as I recall, um, you're, you're, you've got a music scholarship, um, but you're interested in psychology mm-hmm. and you're still singing and you were in a little theater company in high school. You're talking about street of dreams. Yes, I am. Yes. Um, yeah, so, um, Dean and Josh, who were... Joshua Marchese and Dean Clark. Were... For those who don't know them. Yeah. Um, they started this company, and, uh, so, yeah, I auditioned for that, and, um, I mean, I was doing the school plays, Mm -hmm. and then, but then they decided to start this little company to be able to do our own stuff and the school agreed to let us use the stage and stuff like that for our stuff. Um, and so that was, so that was the beginning of that. And, but they were a year ahead of us. So when they, when they left for college, then it was like, well, is this going to die because they left or are we going to keep it going? And so, Mm -hmm. so we continued to do that and you and, Sandra Wayne and Megan Sturmer were the triumvirate that um, were uh, handed the baton when they left. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so we kept doing stuff. And and that's really when I that's really when I got to see the way that you um, really keep things moving forward, you know, and. um, because there were people who we go to our meetings and stuff like that. And there were people who would say, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that because they enjoyed saying it in the meeting and then they wouldn't do anything. And then you would pick it up and keep it going. And uh, we, we'd end up, you know, doing these things anyway. Um, But, you know, sometimes people had a hard time with when it, once it's all happening and it's, and it's, you know, successfully happening, then it's like, why does Michael Sullivan, he's, he directed this and he directed this and then he let somebody else do it. (laughs) It 
Yeah, <laughs> let somebody else do it. Like, have somebody else follow through like they said they were going to do, as opposed to flaking and then Michael picking it up. But um, so, yeah, yeah you learn so, a lot of stuff through through all of that. The, yeah. The, that, yeah. that step, I think that Street of Dreams was so important for everybody who was in it because Josh went on to be a TD and I think, mm-hmm. you know, at, at South Coast and different places. And Dean mm-hmm. is teaching, was teaching theater, I think, in Sweden or something. Having that little theater company and what people learned in that pressure cooker of the company that because we tried to be a collective also for a while that it it really we learned a huge amount about, mm-hmm. you know, about just going ahead and doing stuff. Yeah, to, that you don't have to yeah. wait for the grownups to. Yeah. To do it like we can we can do it. Yeah. And so I, so in that time you were now. So when you're in state, I know that you were. So we were singing together. We were doing we were singing uh, in a Christmas caroling choir and we were singing at uh, madrigals that are at the Renaissance Fair. Both every groups year. that you started. OK. And so <laughs> we're, we so you're doing a lot of singing with that and you were getting your degree in. Psychology. psychology at this point yeah and you were working doing theater outside like uh, lead a horse to water and different shows like that so what was that leap like from like a company like uh oh and working at city college doing musicals at city college yeah well that was first i mean like yeah. the um when i first got to to state i was very much in the music department very just because I, as a freshman, got to be in the recording and touring uh, choir that they didn't normally have freshmen in. And um, so, and that was four days a week, whereas most classes are either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday. This was Monday, Thursday. So that really set what else you could take Mm -hmm. um, uh, because it just kind of went across the, the, the week. And um, so I did that for, um, I can't remember a lot, at least a couple of years of the four years that I was there. I, at least half of that was doing that. And then, um, and then uh, you were, while you were at City, and uh, then I ended up in the summer, two summers doing plays at City, um, which was really fun. And uh, and I really just liked the shows there more than I liked the shows that I saw at at state at that time. Like the big school mm-hmm. plays there were not. Sorry, whoever was part of that, but frankly, it just wasn't that good <laughs> compared to the shows that were happening at city. And so it was really fun to to do that. But I just did it in the summers because I didn't really have time and space. I needed to get acclimated to college life which um required a lot more focus and a lot more time doing homework and reading and writing papers and stuff like that than compared to in high school so between um the the concert choir and uh and then I got to take have uh private lessons Mm. with an opera singer Jeanette Hill and she taught me how to mix, which was huge for me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was very, you know, it was like, there was just a lot going on there. And then, then once, uh, once I, she got married and she was an opera singer and she got married and moved to France, I guess. Like you do. Yeah. Like you do. And, and then there was a certain point where it was like, okay, I'm not really going to get a music degree I just really wanted to have this experience but if I want to sing and I'm not planning to be an opera singer and uh, you know and I'm not planning to be a music teacher so I don't really need to have a music degree but I I know that I am interested in psychology and you can't just be a psychologist without a degree but you can be Mm. a singer without a degree yeah so so I focused on that and um, got my BA and and then um, then that's when you know I had the opportunity to do my first professional show and that was you can lead a horse to water and um, yeah now what 
what was it what do you think that was that that uh attracted you to psychology I think that I just was very interested. First of all, um, George Washington had a psychology class. Mm. You know, like as far as a lot for high school. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I know, I mean, certainly the school that I teach at, that's great, um, but they don't have a psychology class. And um, and I'm not aware of high schools offering that now. But fortunately, Washington did. And I was just very, very interested in, you know, human behavior and why people do the things that they do. Why do they make the choices that they make? What, it, what you know, what is the, the driving force within people to be a certain way, you mm-hmm. know? And that absolutely overlaps with being an actor and trying to understand like why you know what what's up with this character you know because sometimes you're playing people that you don't agree with you know Mm -hmm. but you have to and everything isn't given to you so you the part there's the given circumstances and then there's the part that you have to fill in with the backstory and that sort of thing and Ah, I'm just always very interested in that. And I think I think what really, um, you know, uh, sparked that curiosity, I think really had to do with um, had to do with my relationship with my dad, you know, mm. because there was always sort of like the 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 friction that we had. And at the same mm. time, I. You know, there's so much that I inherited from him. Like, um, you know, I, you know, he's, he was tall. I'm tall, you know, and dark and athletic. Like, you know, like my mom and my sister weren't really athletic. And, um, but I I thought you did gymnastics. Yeah, gymnastics. I played softball in a league um, when I was little too. Um, and, uh, you know, I just loved riding my bike and roller skating and, and playing playing uh, different sports and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I wasn't really, like, super, um, I wasn't, like, super, super a jock, per se, mm-hmm. but I was, but I was, I mean, I just enjoyed, you know, doing stuff physically mm-hmm. and you know I was I was the kind of girl who would climb a tree or something like that which now is not maybe not as big of a deal as like that was like that was sort of like the definition of being a tomboy is that you're climbing trees and mm-hmm. um and so and always snagging my tights like you know we were dr- more dressed up back then you know um, yeah. school clothes were you know like what people wear to school would be considered play clothes then. Yeah. Not what you would wear to school. Um, so anyway, you can so you, know, you had that tag so things you... and get get out of whack. Um, but uh, so I had a lot of, of things in common with my dad. He taught me how to roller skate. He was the one who was tossing the ball to me to practice with softball and you know, um, he was he was a really great bowler. He could have been a, a pro bowler. And um, so a lot of times we would go with him when he was practicing and I enjoyed, you know, but he just showed me how to do a lot of a lot of that stuff, you know, that, um, you know, taught me how to ride a bike and all of those kinds of things. And so we had that. And then he's a singer. He's, he was a great singer. And um, so we just had a lot in common and at the same time there was this this friction and um that i never really understood you know Mm -hmm. what it was about it remains a little bit of a mystery and so i was just always going like what is the deal here why you know why is he doing that why is he i think it really was about trying to understand my dad and Mm -hmm. um that just got me really, really curious, um, about, Mm. about people and motivations and motivation and human behavior. And, you know, when you have someone that does something and then, 
and then it, it be, it's a problem and then and then he cries and says he's so sorry and then and then it's like okay he's really sorry so let's forgive him and then and that's never happening again and then then it happens again and then it's like yeah. what is happening what is going on i mean it's very it's fascinating well yeah and it has that that <laughs> sense because you know when you're growing up and you look at your parents and they are like you know like i always uh, I used to say that I felt like a lot of religion is based on the fact that when you're a little bitty kid, there are gods, you know, because they can – if you're hungry, hopefully food shows up, and, and if you're cold, there's warmth, and if there's there's a sense of safety, and that as you grow older, the gods recede because your parents become people. But you still have this memory of gods. You still – just mm. embedded in you from babyhood, you have this – this sense of an all-powerful something that could take care of you and mm -hmm. how that split happens for different people with their relationship with their parents. And as your parents, people say, you know, their parents kind of dwindle as they get bigger. Physically, their parents seem smaller and smaller, but also they become more and more human. Mm -hmm. And as they go from being all-powerful beings to being humans and you start seeing the flaws and the cracks and the contradictions and the hypocrisies that so many people have no matter what it can be uh, uh it can be fascinating it can be confusing it can be scary and it sounds like for you that it was fascinating and wanting to figure that out wanting to figure out you know that version of your father one way and then how he is you know as more of a human and what's the relationship how did that happen and why Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Um. So so when you're uh, as I I know you went on to grad school because mm -hmm. you got your advanced degree also in counseling. Yeah. Um. And then what happened after you got out of grad school? So you come out. You've you've got your counseling degree. Well, where to go as a counselor? Well, really, what happened is that once I got out of once I graduated with my BA. At that point, it's like I knew I wanted to continue. I because with a with a BA in psychology, if I wanted to be a therapist, I was going to need an advanced degree. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, at that I was a little bit burnt out because at that point I had been in school since I was two and a half, and I <laughs> yeah. I was just kind of like you know, and I just went straight like boom, boom, boom. There was no like gap year or I'm going to backpack through Europe or whatever. Uh, it was just like straight on through, 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 through from two and a half till graduating with my BA. And so at that point, I wanted to take a little breather. Mm -hmm. And um, so and then I wasn't sure where I was going to be going to grad school. I wasn't sure if I was going to go away or if I still wanted to stay or whatever. I mean, I certainly didn't want to go away to college because I'd been away a lot at, growing up. And so. Um, so, but at, by this point, do I want to go away? And so I decided to take a year, do like a year of post-baccalaureate work, just kind of take other things to kind of fill stuff in, but it's not like high pressurized. And then mm -hmm. I was working at, um, the Center for Institutional Change, uh, on campus where I learned a lot around communication skills and all that stuff. And so I was kind of doing that, and then I applied to counseling and psychology. I got into both of them, but psychology was like, all right, if you're going to do it, you need to start right now. You have to start in the fall, and you go straight through. Whereas counseling was like, you want to take a you want to take a semester off? That's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to go part time for a bit? That's fine. So I went with counseling, even though actually, <laughs> which I don't regret, but it was like in retrospect, it was like, oh, my God, if I had just gone through and gotten the MA in psychology, I could have done that. That was 30. I think it was like 32 units mm -hmm. to get an MS in marriage, family, child counseling was like 61 units. Wow. Yeah, so it was so many units that it was equal to like getting a PhD somewhere else. Wow. And I mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. I wasn't looking at that. I just needed to be able to go part time <laughs> if mm -hmm. I wanted to for a little bit. So I did. And so it took me another 
therefore it took another five years for me to get my MS because mm -hmm. I'm doing a year of post baccalaureate work and I'm going a few semesters part time. And then I still had to do two solid full time years with with um, uh, internships to get my 1500 hours mm -hmm. before I could leave. So while during that time, I'm also doing theater. Mm hmm. You know, and so it's kind of a parallel track that I'm on. And then so then once I come out, I have have um, I do my final. I finish up my um, master's at the same time that I end up in a show. Where I get my equity card. Mm, what show was that? That was um, the Colored Museum at the Eureka Theater. Right. So you've been working at like Lorraine Hansberry Theater and where else? The Julian Theater. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, Theater Works. Mm hmm. Um, so you were still schooling in the daytime, doing summer musicals in the off season and every once in a while doing shows in those days, there were a lot more shows for those people who don't know. There were more, there are so many theaters in San Francisco, so many small theaters in the Bay area that were doing shows on like a, you know, 18 to 20 hours a week of rehearsal, just rehearsing at night. So you could go to school because they knew they weren't paying enough for you to make a living at it necessarily, but it was, but the cost of living was much lower, but still, mm -hmm. It was they weren't trying to get people to quit their day jobs. It, weren't, it wasn't a nine to five as it is very much so now for a well, lot of those, theaters. Well, but those were all non-union. Right, they theaters. were all non-union gigs. Yeah. You know, because at that point, I mean, like Theater Works is a Lort Theater now, but at the time it was a community theater. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I was I was doing a fair amount of theater and. Mm -hmm. um, and then so once I graduated, I was like, well, I can keep on trying to get my other 1500 hours for my license or I can just keep going with theater. And I decided to keep going with theater because at, at that point, some of my internship experiences and stuff were such uh, that I was like. Those people are crazy. Yeah, well, that's the point. And not the clients. No, oh, yeah, I'm right. talking about the clients. I'm, there were mm -hmm. there were there were some like weird um, experiences that I had where I just kind of felt like maybe this this isn't the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. um, but really, that has to do with like where you're working, you know. But I yeah. I was I was just kind of um, done for a while. I was kind of I've kind of fried at that point. Um, uh, you know, and I, it, yeah, I was just kind so, of fried. So now at that point, you get out of grad school and you're getting your your equity card mm -hmm. almost at the same time. And it's interesting because yeah. so many people stay struggle and struggle and struggle to get their uh, MFA so they can get their um, equity card. And uh, and and you were in a relationship at that point mm -hmm. with some local actor. <laughs> uh <laughs> Uh, sure, he was a lovely fellow. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, and so now, how? So when you make that decision after spending all of this time, and then you're like, okay, now I've got my equity card. I'm gonna um, veer towards theater. How did your parents feel about that? Um, hey, do you I think they were quiet but scared, or worried about you, or what? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that that um, uh, I think that they were you know, curious how, how, what's happening next. But I think that, I think one thing that, that, um, I, one thing that I think my parents felt about me is that I was not somebody who, who did things, uh, out rash and, and out of the blue and not thought mm -hmm. out, like through all of this, like I never was like, I'm, I'm, quitting school and I'm not doing you know blah, blah blah it was like I still went through I mean my getting jiggy with it was to go part-time for a couple of semesters you know what I mean? <laughs> you know crazy I mean, so, 
yeah. yeah. So I think that they, you know, they saw that I was, you know, very, um, you know, that I did plan and, uh, that I wasn't just somebody who was, that they were always having to be worried about just popping off and doing weird things. So I, so I don't think that they, uh, I don't think they were worried in, in that sense, like right off the bat, I don't think they were worried. I, I think that they assumed that I was, you know, it was, Seriously. yeah, you know, um, I think after a while though, uh, there was a certain point where I'm, I'm, you know, being a freelance artist for a while. And then that's when, you know, dad starts bringing me applications for, you know, um, jobs at the VA, you mm. know, that kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like they're probably, there's something more stable, um, you know, but it was like, I, I just, you know, nothing against uh, working at the VA. At the VA. I mean, it just, it just wasn't, it just wasn't for me, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so it was kind of things like that where, um, that was kind of, I think, the expression of, hmm, you know, and, and since since I was not contacting. For some reason, I wasn't just calling up Oprah or just calling up Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry, yeah. You know, like, I have him on speed dial. What? Call him. Yeah. You know, um, you could have been in that. You could have done that. And it's like, you know, so that's hard when you have um, people who don't really understand how the business works. And they're kind of like, you know, so the fact that you're not um you know call just calling people up and telling them that you want to be in their next film um is is kind of just unreasonably lazy or something but it, mm. but they didn't think they didn't think I'm lazy they see how hard mm. I'm working but it but, must just not have occurred to you you're not utilizing yeah. all of your options if yeah. you haven't called Tyler Perry right now in um, this time you also had started I know you started working at TBA and you started the business of showbiz. Right. Well, I had, um, that was an idea that I had before it was called the business of showbiz. When I came out of um, grad school, I had had this idea about doing a, a support group, an actor support group. And um, I just, I thought that was a good idea. And, and but it turned out that, um, in general, actors don't want to be in a support group. At least they didn't then. They didn't want to be in a group where they revealed any kind of, you know, concern or uh, insecurity or anything like that. Mm. Like, you know, people feeling like they need to have their game face on all the time because of the, you know, a competition kind of thing. And so you can't be in a group saying, wow, I'm scared or I'm not sure how to how to go about this or how to, you know, navigate this or whatever. And so basically the people that contacted me about the group were people that really needed to be in psychotherapy. You know, mm. so people who could have really benefited from a support group were too cool for a support group. And the people mm. who were calling really needed to be in um, in a psychotherapy situation. And, mm. I, and that's not what I, I didn't really, I didn't want to do psychotherapy. I, I wanted to do support. And I had facilitated a lot of support groups at that point through um, the Center for Institutional Change in state. That's where I got a lot of really good training. And um, so that was the first idea and that didn't really go. And then it was like, okay, so um you know, and I'd had the this experience experiences as a young actor breaking into like when I when I got an agent and I got sent out on auditions for for um, film and video commercials, whatever. And and I was just new to it. And there was a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. And that particular agent 
was not someone who had patience to explain things to you. Somehow, miraculously, you were supposed to know it, but nobody was explaining anything. And so, um, so that was the thing that made me feel like, okay, this is what I need to do is I need to do, if I figure any of this stuff out, I need to teach a workshop, teach workshops on this, you know, so it's not, Mm so, so it's not about people will get support from those classes, but, um, they're not having to admit that they need support by Mm signing right? They can just say, all right, yeah, I want to know about pictures and resumes, how to get an agent. Uh, Do I need a manager? What's the difference between an agent and a manager? How do I, um, you know, uh, choose uh, my headshots? How do I choose a photographer? Um, You know, how do I decide? And it's not like me, um, some things are just, there's an answer, you know, and then other things, it's like a process for them to, to sort these things out, but they have a place to get information and then also to sort of sort things out. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's, that's where the business of showbiz came from. And I, and I was working on this idea, how to craft this idea. And then I took um, um, a life worth living workshop, Carol Lloyd. She wrote a book. I recommend the book. Um, it's called Creating a Life Worth Living. And then she taught a workshop called A Life Worth Living. And then there, um, you know, people come into that workshop to sort of sort out their ideas. And that was what I, and then that's where I came up with the title. Because that was one of our mm. assignments was to figure out the title for mm. our, the thing. And so that's when I came up with the business of showbiz. Mm-hmm. And it's like, that's a good title. Oh. So... So you're, you're okay. Uh, uh, when you were working, you're doing and you're freelancing, which is what the vast majority of actors do, uh, is freelancing. Um, and there are very few resident theater companies, despite the fact that people either in the Bay Area theater companies either say they're theater companies and they're not, they're production companies, or they say they're repertory theater companies and they're not because they don't do anything in rep. They're just production houses. Um, but you uh, come in contact with the San Francisco Mime Troupe, which actually does have a resident theater company. Mm-hmm. And how did that happen? How did What was your first thing there? Well, um, I'm not sure if the first time I saw a company in the park, if it was like Make a Circus or if it was the Mime mm-hmm. Troupe. And mm-hmm. I was in, in high school, but I remember they, you know, they had this set up there and they had the band and they had like a saxophone that was very uh, prominent in the sound. And, and, and it was kind of like, it just, it reminded me of like Bugs Bunny or something like the, mm. the, mus- the musical, musicalization of the movement and stuff like that, that, that was really, and I, and I remember thinking similarly to when I saw Guys and Dolls, it, it's just kind of like, ooh that looks fun, you know? So that was mm-hmm. a long time, like a long time ago. And then the first time that I really saw um, a show that I knew for a fact, it was the Mime Troupe was um, seeing Double, which which you were in. And, mm-hmm. um, and that was like, that was big. That was such a big, uh, important show about Israel, Palestine, and two state solution and i didn't know anything about israel palestine which Mm -hmm. which sounds ridiculous to me saying that but we didn't get taught about it it was too controversial and Mm. so we didn't get taught about it in high school in college and when when you'd hear people say and this is a line from the play but it's true uh, when here, when someone would bring up the Middle East, they would just go, oh, it's complicated. And that would be it. And I'd be like, Compl- what's complicated? OK, all right, yeah. whatever. You know, and so I saw the show that was really uh, entertaining. It was really fun. It was very funny. And but at the same time, very informative and really inclusive of a lot of different perspectives. Um, so I got so much information so much different ways of looking at the situation 
uh, than I had ever gotten anywhere, all from this play that's like an hour and 10 minutes or something. And that was very important because I felt like, wow, I would love to do something like that at least once. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's yeah. that's what I felt. And so, um, and you guys were t- taking it all over the place and you played off Broadway and you were recording the cast album at, at Fantasy Studios. I mean, it was very, very glamorous looking as well. Not from the inside. As well as really important and impactful. I mean, that that definitely, you know. So from there, I was hoping for an opportunity to do it at some point. I mean, like when I saw that, I was still in I was still in grad school because mm-hmm. one and one of the writers was Emily Shahade and she was a classmate of mine. And mm-hmm. and um, so I she was so eccentric to me. And and the thing that one of the things that really struck me about Emily is that she was always announcing who was Jewish, but nice anyway, you know, God. and I was like, why does she keep doing that? Like I I was oblivious. And then mm-hmm. she mentioned that uh, some I think at some point she did say that she was Palestinian, but I didn't know what that meant vis-a-vis mm-hmm. people who yeah. are Jewish, yeah. you know, and that and so why she would say, yes, well, I met this person and they were they they were Jewish. Nice, nice person, you know, like mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, why did she have to tell me that they're Jewish and why did she have to reassure me that they're nice? And and so she, this is just how she spoke all the time. And she was very talkative. And and so I just didn't get it until mm-hmm. I saw her when you were getting ready. You guys were getting ready to go to Israel, Palestine. And mm. I, and I think I think she was at the airport. I'm like, you know, what are you doing? Because oh. I mean, I know her from school, San Francisco State Counseling Department. Right. You know, and and so it was like, oh, um. So that was amazing. And so then from there. Now, also, I want to say I, that when I when I went to when we took the show to uh, Israel, Palestine, you were not so hot on me going. No, there were bombings that were were happening, you know, um, just like leading up to it. You know, there were there was things were like really heating up there. And right. and I was like, so just out of curiosity, like I'm trying to find where the line is. It's like, what would have to happen that would make you guys decide not to go? Mm -hmm. Like, because you guys are moving forward and they're blowing shit up there, you know? So like what, what, um, and, and it was just like, well, we're going, I mean, it's important. And it's like, yeah, but I don't know. It, yeah, I, I I wasn't really feeling like, yay, they're going somewhere where they could all be killed. Woo. Yeah, we didn't have the T-shirts that said that yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and we had just, you and I had just moved in together mm-hmm. at that point for the first time. And so we were together, and then I was flying away to a dangerous place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah. that's... Okay. Well, but here's the thing. So, yeah, like, I no, I wasn't... Uh, I was nervous about it, but I also, but the other side of it, because I feel like sometimes you bring that up, like, you know, like, uh, I don't know. Like, that was odd. That was an odd. Oh, no, no, no. I totally know it's not odd. Okay. Um, But because the other side of it, though, is that I come from a military family and my dad went to Vietnam and it was there for a year. And lots of people were blown up and killed there. And the and then lots of people who made it back were really injured and damaged. So, um, you know, I know what it's like to be part of a family that you support the person that they're getting ready to go somewhere dangerous and you hold down the fort for them. Um, keep the home fires burning. You know, right. and so, so because I I had a a friend who had who had said I mean 
<laughs> you know her too, uh, a, a, someone that we worked with who was like, just about the touring, not even specifically about that trip, but just all that touring um, where you could be gone eight, 12 weeks at a time repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I couldn't do that. And I was like, what do you mean you couldn't do it? I mean, what? what? Uh, I just didn't understand. Like, if you're not going, what are you talking about? You couldn't do it. She was like, I couldn't do it. If he's not there, what good is he? Mm. You know, like, I don't need a boyfriend that's gone. I need a boyfriend that's right here with me, you mm. know? And so if, so she was like, I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stay with somebody who's constantly leaving. Mm -hmm. And that was really, for me, that was really bizarre because I was, I came from a family where you didn't quit somebody just because they're, they're work took them out of town yeah. right that's i forgot to say like there was that point when you were still in grad school i think where you uh understudied up at uh oregon shakes and well, you were gone for no um the understudying happened after i went to go do a my name is alice oh that's right yes you went up to do it yeah i did yeah. that show i did one for my baby and then while i was working there someone from cal shake saw me and asked me if i could cover Dolores Mitchell and a right. member of the wedding. Right. So you were there for how long for that for 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 is that ten weeks? Uh ten or twelve weeks. I was there for the summer. Yeah. So you also had the experience uh, uh, before I did of being the person who was away, and I think that also can help in terms of uh, you know the person understanding what it's like, you know, on both sides. Um, but I want to ask you now, what was your, I can't remember, and I know I should, your first job with the Mime Troop, was it knocked up or was it social work? That's a good question now. I'm, I'm having a hard time. I think it might've been, I think it might've been knocked up. Right. But I'm not, and I, you know, I'm not sure because. Um, I, think it, I think it was because I yeah. think that was everyone's in, uh, introduction to you. And so uh, can yeah. you tell us a little about what that was, what about Knocked Up and what you did on that show? I was a musician. I was the musician for the show. And, um, you know, it was a small uh, second stage show that was touring um, schools and jails and um i i was definitely nervous about doing it because the person who had been doing it before he he left the production was you know one of the jazz musicians that um you know the mime troops musicians are 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 you know known for being pretty uh virtue virtuosic <laughs> um <laughs> really really good really really good at what they do and play a variety of instruments and all this sort of thing and or and just or if they just play the one like they're you know amazing on it and so like yes i i play guitar but and i love playing and everything but it's just well enough to you know support me as a singer mainly it's not like mm -hmm. i'm not doing any fancy anything on the on the guitar um and so i was definitely like are you sure that that i'm the right person for this you know because it's going to be it's going to be um nothing fancy mm -hmm. um and uh but you know if you feel like you know, I was willing to give it, I was willing to give it a go and I did. And so it was like guitar and a triangle and a bass drum and, you know, like just doing all the, the different sounds and stuff for the characters. And, um, and that was pretty fun. Um, you know, once it was got situated of what it is I'm doing, what my lane is, um, you know, it, it was, it was fun and it was a good um 
opportunity to kind of see what it's like to not be, to get to perform, but not be the one on stage, you know? Mm. So it was very, mm -hmm. um, there was something that was, that was kind of freeing about it because it didn't matter. Like I, I could just do my mime troop t-shirt and black jeans and, you know, um, I'm, I'm done. It, you know, I can wear my glasses. I can, you know, I don't have to, um, you know, oh, you know what? I need to, here we go. What? I just need to plug in the computer because it somehow it got unplugged at some point. Um, hmm. uh, so yeah, so that was really fun to get to do, but I was definitely very nervous about it and, and afraid that I, you know, um, that the musicians, the, the, in the troupe were going to, you know, make fun of me or something like that. And, uh, I, I felt really appreciative of Dred Scott actually, um, complimenting me. Hmm. And, uh, I was just like, Thank you. <laughs> you know, and then actually, I actually got, there was a review uh, and I actually got positively reviewed and I did not expect that. I was just, mm. I, I was definitely just holding down the fort so the show could move forward because someone had quit at the last minute, you know? Um, so, yeah, so that was really cool and, and an important show. Um, it's a pro-choice show and, I I agree with that, and uh, so it was fun to have a chance to be a part off to the side um, uh, of of uh, a sh another show that I think you know was was saying important things and was really well received, particularly in the jails, um, mm -hmm. and so that was fun. And uh, but then my, so my first show as an actor with the troupe was, again, I was replacing someone, uh, Amara Tabor, Amara. Actually, yeah. who um, had done the, the summer, but didn't want to leave town and go on the fall tour. So that was uh, an opportunity for me to, where people thought of me. And, and that uh, was social work. Social work. And so I, I went on, on tour and I was working Which was at, interesting because we got to play a couple. Was that the first time that we played a couple? Ever? It might have been. Maybe. Yeah. 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 yeah I think it was. Um, I guess so. I don't, yeah. Um, yeah, so... So you got to go on tour. So I got to go on tour. I was working at Theater Bay Area at the time on staff. And um, so I needed to take six weeks unpaid leave to be able to go and do do that. Um, and so that was that was a that was a great experience. I mean, it was it was a lot. It was a lot. It's a lot uh, touring uh, there, you know, just the setups and the strikes and the, you know, the long drives and all of that stuff. It's, it's very demanding. Um, but it's also just really, uh, it's, it's also a great adventure to get to, to go to different parts of the country as an adult. Um, mm -hmm. and, and see, and there are places I hadn't been and see for myself because the United States is a gigantic country and there are all these different like micro cultures within the country and and each place has its own image right mm -hmm. and so it's very it's very interesting to go and see for yourself and meet people for yourself and um so I I I definitely appreciated that right away and uh, so then from there, I was like, okay, so I got a chance to do, uh, perform in a show once. And so, but then it was like, well, I'd love to create, be the creator of a character and not a replacement, you know, to have the experience of originating the character 
at least once. Mm-hmm. So. So what was the first summer show you did? Um, Escape to Siberia. Mm. Mm-hmm. I played uh, Sister Double Melanin, Sister Double Melanin, and Sister Love. Yeah. Um, and Ice with- Kareem. And Ice Kareem and a bunch of other people. I mean, like that was a show. I played seven characters in that show. Mm-hmm. So, which is so different. That's one of the things. You know, for people who see Mime Troop shows, uh, uh, it it's they don't always necessarily get how unique that experience is for the actors. When actors come and work for the Mime Troop, and they're like, "Wait a minute, I'm playing this person. Yeah, and you're playing this person, this person, and this person. You have to you have to differentiate these characters. And sometimes you only have the amount of time you're doing a quick change backstage to come in as somebody from a different country with a different background, a different age, a completely different story. Mm-hmm. And and so that in the end of the show, when only, you know, five or seven or however many people come out and, and, and bow and the audience is just like, that's it. So <laughs> yeah. it's such a, Where is everybody? Such, where is everybody? So it is such a different experience. Like I said, I think Mime Troop audiences don't always appreciate what a weird experience that is for actors who haven't worked in a company like the Mime Troop mm-hmm. when they come in and how how it stretches your muscles, how you change you, you as an actor, how much it affects your your uh your i don't know your toolkit you know is yeah. is different than a toolkit that you have for an, uh for actors that don't do that well i think that it's the thing that's really fun about it is that you're you're getting to to sort of live the dream in a way as an actor is that that idea of like i can play anything you know kind of thing and and it's like um but generally there isn't a situation in which you would get to do that. Right. You know, like there's just, there's kind of your lane. Um, and yeah, that, when you're a little kid and you're like, Oh, I'm going to be a pirate and Oh, I'm going to do this. And then I'm a doctor and then I'm gonna do that. And that when you're an actor, a lot of times, yeah. Casting director, see you a certain way, director, see you a certain way, all of these different people, your agent wants you to be a certain way. And yeah. if you get a film, it's very hard. But in theater, you have a little more space. And in a company like the Mime Troupe, you're a pirate. Then you're a doctor. And then you you get to all in the same play. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you do get a chance to sort of stretch and try different things. And um, I mean, there definitely have been times that I, you know, how I was cast, I was like, are you sure? <laughs> you know, um, oh, like what? well, you know, um, I would say like with, uh, with Chanel, mm-hmm. you know, um, what show was that? That was city, city? Uh, uh, Coast, city, Coast city confidential. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm supposed to play this like, you know, super, super devastatingly sexy, powerful, uh, you know, power behind the throne sort of person who is able to really manipulate people with her, you know, gorgeousness or whatever and um, pulchritude. And and I was like, OK. Uh, all right. <laughs> and. um You know, another, I mean, well, like with Faustina, when uh, Red in, State. in Red State, you know, the question of like how to show her, uh, her, her evolution, her, the way that she's, what she's becoming because of her, you know, her greed for, uh, you know, Advanced. power. Yeah. Hmm? For yeah, advancement. She's trying yeah. to climb up this ladder and what that is turning her into. Um, and of course, we work in an exaggeration. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, like, the time that I I did something really extreme or whatever, and you're like, that's it. And I'm like, what? I was just horsing <laughs> around. And so, like, that that kind of happens a lot, you know, where, where you can do something that's, that you feel like is beyond, uh, beyond, beyond the pale, the pale. And then, and then all of a sudden like, Oh, perfect. And it's, 
okay. Um, well, sometimes those choices, like with that, mo- I remember that moment where it, it ends up being so essential, you know, when you're like, the character is afraid, so they scream. Mm-hmm. And when you're just messing around, you just go ahead and scream. And mm-hmm. the director would go, yes, that's it. That's the essence of what's going on right there. Mm-hmm. As opposed to those other choices uh, where the person is trying to indicate it in some other way. And you mm-hmm. really want to just go, uh, as long as you know what the essence of it is, and if that if everything is up to that scale, then you have to be to make this moment huge enough to show the madness or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You have to really kind of do it in a way that's different from other theater companies. Oh, but I also wanted to bring up, though, and I know we actually only have uh, a few minutes left. Um, uh, throughout this period, throughout all of this, you were also doing television and movies. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it was like there was a period there where it seemed like if there was a television show or a film coming to San Francisco, you were going to be cast in it. Uh, yeah. What was that like? Well, um, I mean, it was it was fun in in one sense, but it was also very stressful because um, a lot of times things would happen where, you know, the shooting schedule was all over the place. I mean, like generally when you're doing theater, it's like we're opening on this day. The run is this long. We close on this day. There's a possible extension, you know, that they include that in the you know the agreement that you're signing so if you accept the offer but with film it's like okay um i audition for something you know i my agent calls me about something and it's like well when is it shooting and i'm thinking about i have this show i'm doing and then they're like oh it's gonna be you know um in may and it's like all right well if it's done in may then it's not going to conflict with, you know, a July 4th opening for mm-hmm. the Mime Troupe. And then it's like something happens. Uh, the the lead ends up doing something happens there and they can't start until June. And then everybody gets sick and then they, they shut down shooting. And then it, and then it, everything is just like rolling all the way right on to, you know, and th- that happened a lot where, the things that weren't supposed to be a conflict ended up being absolutely a conflict. And so there were times when I would say, you know, exercise my, um, you know, more remunerative employment clause with the theater Mm -hmm. and say, I have this shoot and everything, but then, you know, and I, I did that a few times, but, um, you know, it, it didn't feel good. It, it's like when that happens, it's like it, it's hard to have fun. Like, yay, I, I get to go do this this shoot when you know that it's it's really um, creating this hardship on, mm-hmm. um, you know, this show that you're in. And um, and then uh, I also just had a problem with a lot of things that I that I did that ended up not in the film after all. Mm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and so, um, yeah, I mean, there'd be these, these conflicts and then, you know, I, I ended up not in, um, I ended up not in Ed, Ed TV, not in nine months, not in Metro, not in sneakers, sneakers that yeah. hurt you know that was like the first maybe the first one and i was very excited because i had a a scene with robert redford you know mm-hmm. and i mean it was just one scene you know and that's what makes it so easy to cut when you just have right one scene. yeah and so yeah so i mean i i worked with all these people i worked so like i said with robert redford i had a scene with eddie murphy i had a scene with um is it Dustin Hoffman or? I wasn't going to be in a scene exactly with him, but, it, you know, in that we weren't going to be like talking to each other, but we were, it was like, I actually am, instead of them showing the scene, like mm-hmm. uh, I'm, what they did was they put the scene on a television screen. Oh yeah. So that 
there's people talking and then by it's like little little tiny you little know tiny it's like you. that's what, that's what they did you, with the scene but you did end up in milk yeah that you know and you ended up in that in the television movie Shaughnessy yeah though you were killed yeah and party of five so you got to do stuff yeah oh yeah i mean there's stuff that i did but i'm just saying that there was there was like a really kind of bizarre stretch there where i i was cast in things and um and i still get residuals and that sort of thing but um that, but it was, you know, where you just keep getting excited about, oh, we're going to, let's go see this. And, like, I didn't even know that my scene wasn't in uh, Metro. Right. I didn't even know that. So we went to the opening, the San Francisco opening of the film. I'm all excited waiting to see, and it never shows up, you know. And, like, that sucks. That hurts, Yeah. That's hard. That is. And and I and I worked a lot on that one, you know. And it wasn't just like showing up for a day, and it was like, oh well, it was a day. It was like, um, it it was actually quite a bit of comparatively. Of it was work. an important scene. I mean, for those um, of you who don't know, or if you've ever seen that film, uh, uh, yeah, there's a scene at the beginning that's supposed to set up pretty much the entire relationship between Eddie Murphy and whatever his name is. Rappaport. Michael Rappaport. Michael Rappaport. It's supposed to set up everything else in the film. And uh, and it was Valina's scene, and they cut that scene, so the film sucks and doesn't make any sense. Well, it does. It does. Because it doesn't make any sense without the setup. So Well, it's doing very well. It's man. still playing places. Well, yeah, I'll, I mean... But it's no, I mean, be really, page. you know, compared it, it, to they, most of the other. But it's 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 a very Hollywood kind of thing in a way. It's mm -hmm. the sort of thing that normally doesn't happen in theater. Because normally, as you're workshopping through a show, by the time you get to rehearsal and hopefully by opening, it's been crafted in such a way that it makes sense. Whereas in Hollywood, it's the reverse of that, where you might have a script that makes sense. You might. Then the director takes it, and they might pull it apart and do something, but they're still trying to make sense. And then it gets shot. And that's when the process begins because then the, the director might make a different decision. The, the agents of the actors might decide they want different scenes shot for their, for their actor. The producers might decide they want to alter it a little bit. So the thing that ends up getting shot can be so different from the thing that gets to the theater and who has control over that is not the writer you know, and sometimes is the director. So the process is kind of backwards. And that really uh, is something that I think that is very frustrating for actors. They're not understanding that. You're going from, from theater to film and going, that's not what we shot, you know? Whereas in a play, what you perform is what you get. Yeah. So it's very different. Uh, but actually, I want to, uh, we should probably stop here. We've, we've actually gone longer. Then, yeah, uh, this is really, really do. But, you know, I uh, uh there's a lot. And well, we and uh, it through to this far. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> and so, uh yeah, and so, you know, I um, there are going to be people who I'm going to go back and interview again to kind of get more of the life because a lot of it ends up being very much biographical, which is what makes the person who they are. But sometimes there's even more in terms of philosophy and and psychology that they want that that now is kind of now that we've got the groundwork, we might go back and I might just go back and just do conversations just about philosophy and just about um, inspiration and stuff. So anyway, but I want to thank you very much, Felina Brown. I'll be seeing you in just a moment because after I finish this, I'll just go in there and kiss you because I can. <laughs> ha ha. Gloat, gloat, gloat. And, uh, and uh, thank you so much. And I will uh, see every. Well, I won't see anybody, but hopefully you will see us at the next uh, Mimecast. So thanks a lot. Bye-bye, Valina. Bye-bye, honey. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Mimecast. The Mimecast logo was animated by Adon Gonzalez. The song you're listening to right now is El Pueblo Unidos by Sergio Ortega, arranged and performed by Dred Scott.